Additional nine cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed, which takes the total number now to 18,191. A total of 880 patients are currently in hospital with suspected or confirmed COVID-19, which is an increase of 15 since yesterday, but it includes a decrease of 23 in the number of confirmed cases. As of last night, 23 people were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, uh, which is an increase of two on the number that I reported yesterday. Unfortunately, in the past 24 hours, four deaths of patients who had been confirmed as having the virus have been registered, which takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,480. In addition, National Records of Scotland has just published its more detailed weekly report. Uh, these figures report deaths where COVID has been confirmed by lab tests and also cases where the virus was entered on a death certificate as a suspected or contributory cause of death. The latest NRS report covers the period uh, to Sunday, 21st June. At that point, according to our daily figures, 2,472 deaths of people who had tested positive for the virus had been registered. However, today's report shows that by Sunday, the total number of registered deaths with either a confirmed or presumed link to the virus was 4,119. Of those, 49 were registered in the seven days up to Sunday, which is a decrease from 69 the week before. Uh, this is the eighth week in a row in which the number of deaths from the virus has fallen. The number of excess deaths, the number above the five-year average for the same time of year, was 39, which is up from 34 in the previous week. However, for context, the number of excess deaths 10 weeks ago was 878. Deaths in care homes made up 41% of the total COVID deaths last week, and the number of COVID deaths in care homes reduced again from 35 to 20. These statistics tell of real and sustained progress. But even though the number of deaths from COVID is reducing, we must never become inured to them. Every death represented in these numbers is a tragedy, the loss of a unique and loved individual. And I want to send my condolences to everyone who is grieving as a result of this virus. I'm also aware that talking about statistical trends will not provide them with any consolation whatsoever. However, the trends are clear, and for all the pain that this virus is still causing and the real risk it still poses, they are positive. And they give us confidence now to set some firmer milestones for our route out of lockdown. The Scottish Government first published the route map for leaving lockdown on 21st May, almost five weeks ago. The week before we did so, more than 300 people in Scotland died from the virus. At the peak of the epidemic back in April, 660 people died from the virus in a single week. As I've just reported in the most recent week, the number of deaths reduced to 49. At the time of publishing the route map, the R number was between 0.7 and 1. Now it is between 0.6 and 0.8. And on 21st May, we estimated that 25,000 people in Scotland at that time had the virus and were capable of transmitting it to others. Our most recent estimate was that 2,900 people were infectious and tomorrow when we publish the updated assessment, I expect it to have fallen further to around 2,000. This progress, of course, is due to people across Scotland doing the right thing and following the rules. And I want to record my thanks again to everyone today for doing that. The sacrifices that have been made have suppressed the virus, though I know how hard and at times painful they have been. They have also protected the NHS and they have undoubtedly saved a significant number of lives. They've also brought us to the position where we can now look ahead with a bit more clarity to our path out of lockdown. But let me stress that each step on this path depends on us continuing to beat the virus back. If we don't do that, we can't take these steps forward. And if the virus starts to spread again, the steps we have already taken may need to be reversed. That is what we must do absolutely everything in our power to avoid. That means continuing with the careful approach that has brought us to where we are now. Our pace is slightly slower than England's, but it is, in my view, right for our circumstances. And I hope it is more likely to be sustainable than if we went faster now. Maintaining our progress also means all of us abiding by public health guidance. Wearing face coverings in enclosed spaces, avoiding crowded places, washing our hands and cleaning surfaces regularly, maintaining physical distancing and agreeing to immediately self-isolate and get a test if we have symptoms. All of these basic protections matter now much more than ever. They will reduce the ability of the virus to spread even as we all get out and about a bit more. 
And that, presiding officer, is the key point. The virus has not gone away, and it will not go away of its own accord. It will pose a real and significant threat for some time to come, so we must not ever be complacent in the face of it. We must keep working to drive it down further towards the point of elimination, because that then gives us the best chance of keeping it under control through testing, surveillance, contact tracing, and the application of targeted suppression measures when that is necessary. The prize, if we succeed, is getting greater normality back in our lives, and maybe more quickly than we would have envisaged a few weeks ago, and hopefully without reversals back into blanket lockdown. And nowhere does any of that matter more than in our schools. As John Swinney said yesterday, blended learning is a necessary contingency because we might need it. There are no certainties with this virus. But the progress we have made so far now makes it possible to plan for a full-time return to school in August with appropriate safety measures in place. To achieve this aim, though, we must continue to drive the virus down to the lowest possible levels and keep it there. And I hope that the prospect of getting children back to full-time education sooner rather than later gives us all an added incentive to do exactly that. The same is true of the updated version of the route map that we have published today. That now sets out a series of indicative dates, and I stress indicative dates, for the remainder of phase two and the early part of phase three. This greater clarity is possible because of the progress we've made against the virus, but delivering on the milestones depends on that progress continuing. We will complete our formal three-week reviews as required by law on the 9th and the 30th of July, and I will make statements in Parliament on both of these dates. But I hope today's statement will provide people and businesses across the country with a bit more certainty now in their forward planning. We will also issue detailed guidance ahead of the key dates being indicated today. That guidance will be informed by the advice we commissioned last week from our scientific advisory group on two key issues. Firstly, what, if any, further mitigations are required in locations that might pose a higher risk of transmission? And second, what settings, circumstances and with what mitigations it might it be possible to allow a relaxation of the two metres physical distancing rule? I will receive that advice next week and report on it by the 2nd of July and we will issue guidance as soon as possible after that. However, there are three general points I want to make today in advance of it. First, unless and until we have confidence that the risk of moving away from it in certain circumstances can be mitigated, businesses and individuals must continue to comply with the two metres physical distance rule. However, I do understand the concerns businesses in certain sectors in particular have about this, and so I hope that in the period ahead, we can find a viable and a safe balance. Second, we will take a decision on whether to make face coverings mandatory in shops, as we have already done in public transport, in light of the advice we receive next week. But in the meantime, we will join with the retail sector in a campaign to promote and encourage their use. Third, to support our test and protect system, businesses in the hospitality sector will be required to take names and contact details of customers and store these for four weeks. So they should be preparing for that now. Uh, let me turn now to the updated route map. As I announced last week, non-essential retail can reopen from Monday. So too can workplaces in the manufacturing sector that have been closed until now. Outdoor playgrounds and outdoor sports courts can also open from Monday. However, I can confirm indicative dates now for the rest of phase two and for the early part of phase three. Uh, let me repeat though, that all of these depend on continued suppression of the virus. I can confirm that on the 3rd of July, it is our intention to lift the guidance advising people in Scotland to travel no more than five miles for leisure and recreation purposes. And although the tourism sector will not open fully until the 15th of July, we intend that self-contained holiday accommodation, for example, holiday cottages and lodges or caravans where there are no shared services, can open from the 3rd of July. However, we would ask people to use good judgment, abide by the rules that apply at any time to households meeting up and be sensitive to those living in our rural and island communities. And the advice, of course, remains to avoid crowded places. As we hopefully suppress the virus further, we will also continue to consider any measures that might be necessary to protect against the risk of imported cases of the virus. 
It is then our intention that outdoor hospitality, such as beer gardens, will be permitted to reopen on Monday the 6th of July. That gives a few days after we receive advice from the advisory group for guidance to be issued and any necessary mitigations to be put in place. I hope that we will then be able to move to phase three of the route map on the 9th of July, but as indicated earlier, I will make a further statement to Parliament on that date. However, as was the case with phase two, I don't expect that we will do everything in phase three at the same time. Instead, we will take a phased approach. The resumption of NHS and other public services, for example, will continue during the three-week period. I, however, I will give some indicative dates now for the early part of phase three. Others uh, will be added later. We intend that from the 10th of July, households will be able to meet people from more households outdoors with physical distancing, and I will confirm the details of that in my 2nd of July update. I also hope at that point to confirm an expansion of the extended household model and also some changes that will give young people more opportunities to mix with their friends over the summer holiday period. However, I can confirm now that organised outdoor sports for children and young people can, subject to guidance, resume from the 13th of July. We also expect that non-essential shops within indoor shopping centres will reopen from the 13th of July, subject to guidance on physical distancing and other measures. From 15th July, we intend that a household will be able to meet indoors with people from up to two other households, subject to physical distancing and strict hygiene measures. We intend that early learning and childcare services will be able to resume from 15th July, subject to individual provider arrangements. It is likely, though, presiding officer, that capacity will remain restricted initially. As we have indicated, the tourism sector generally, and therefore all holiday accommodation, can reopen from the 15th of July. We intend that indoor locations such as museums, galleries, monuments, cinemas and libraries will also be able to reopen from that date, but with precautions in place. For example, tickets being secured in advance and, of course, subject to physical distancing and strict hygiene. Unfortunately, though, theatres, bingo halls, nightclubs, casinos and other uh, live entertainment venues will not reopen until a later date. We intend that pubs and restaurants will open indoors from the 15th of July, but on a limited basis initially and subject to a number of conditions. Detailed guidance will be issued as soon as possible. Uh, and last but not least, for many of us, we intend that hairdressers and barbers will reopen from the 15th of July. Um, other personal retail services will remain closed until a later date. The other changes presiding officer planned under phase three require further consideration and assessment. These include communal worship, indoor live entertainment venues, outdoor live events under certain conditions, indoor gyms, and the lifting of restrictions on attendance at weddings and unfortunately funerals. I'm not able to give indicative dates for these today. However, my judgment now is that these changes are unlikely to take effect before the 23rd of July, although we will of course keep that under close review. In addition, before the end of July, we will provide further advice to those who are shielding. We want, if we can, to move away from the current position of blanket guidance for all shielding people to much more tailored advice about risk and how to mitigate it. Presiding officer, our challenge, uh, which is not an easy one, is to manage all of this change while keeping this virus firmly under control. If at any stage there appears to be a risk of its resurgence, our path out of lockdown will be halted and we may even have to go backwards. To avoid that, we must get as close as possible to elimination of the virus now and build confidence in our ability to control it in future through surveillance, testing, contact tracing and, where necessary, targeted suppression measures. If we can do that, then the move from phase three to phase four will become possible, perhaps as we go into August. That won't be easy, and it certainly, at this stage, cannot be taken for granted. But we can all play a part in making it happen. Complying with the requirements of Test and Protect is absolutely vital. An information leaflet about Test and Protect is being delivered to every household across Scotland this week. But let me take the opportunity now to remind everyone watching, and indeed everyone in the Chamber, what it asks of all of us. If you have symptoms of the virus, you and your household must self-isolate and book a test immediately. The symptoms to watch out for are a new cough, a fever or a loss of or change in your sense of taste or smell. If you experience any of these symptoms, please do not wait to see if you feel better. Uh, later that day or the next day, take action straight away. 
You should book a test at nhsinform.scot or by phoning NHS 24 on 0800 028 2816. Presiding officer, I hope this statement has been useful in providing some further clarity on changes that are likely to take effect in the early part of the summer. Uh, both I and my ministerial colleagues will keep Parliament updated over the course of recess. As I said earlier, I'll make further statements in the Chamber on 9th and 30th of July, and I will also provide regular updates in the daily media briefings. I hope very much that by the time Parliament meets again in two weeks, we will have made further progress in the fight against this virus and be further down the path out of lockdown. But I cannot stress enough that that depends on all of us. The choices we've made to date as individuals and indeed collectively as a society have brought us this far, albeit with a lot of sorrow and anguish along the way. But arguably the choices we make in the coming weeks will be even more important as we learn to work, socialise and live alongside each other again, but in a way that keeps the virus under control. For us to meet each other indoors again, for more businesses to reopen, for children to return to school on a full-time basis in August, all of that depends on all of us acting for the common good. It depends on everyone sticking to the essential public health rules and having the patience to stick with a careful but steady path out of lockdown. So for the moment, except for those who have chosen to form an extended household, please continue only to meet family and friends out of doors. If we stick with that for a further two weeks, I am hopeful that indoor meetings will be possible again soon. And please, at all times, remember our key guidance. Remember the facts. Face coverings should be worn in enclosed spaces, public transport shops and anywhere else where physical distancing is more difficult. Avoid crowded areas. Clean your hands regularly and thoroughly and clean hard surfaces after touching them. Two metre distancing remains the clear advice. Self-isolate and book a test immediately if you have symptoms of COVID and you cough, a fever or a loss of or change in your sense of taste or smell. It is because so many people have done the right things and have stuck so closely to the rules that we are now making such progress. That is what has brought us to a position where we can now see a route back to living less restricted lives. So please stick with it, be sensible and apply careful judgment. In everything we do, we should be thinking not just of our own health, but that of everyone around us too. And if we all continue to do the right thing by each other and by our communities, I do believe we will get through this more quickly. So please, uh, to everybody, uh, my message is this. Stay safe, protect others and save lives. Thank you very much. The First Minister will now take questions. Any member who wishes to ask a question, I would encourage them to press their request to speak button. Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I appreciate advice sight of today's additional statement. And I notice the announcements the First Minister has just made. We'll examine the details over the coming days, but anything which offers more clarity is to be supported. Uh, the First Minister will know that the two-metre rule is regarded by many as central to the debate we're having around opening Scotland back up for business. Many B&Bs, restaurants, pubs and hotels will not be able to cope if it stays in place. Indeed, a third of hotels say they won't be opening because of it, according to the Scottish Tourism Alliance. Now, on the First Minister's timetable, we now have potentially another eight days before we know whether it's going or whether, like last week, the breaks may suddenly and unexpectedly be applied again. And hotels in the hospitality trade are desperate to know on what basis they can open and now accept provisional bookings. Now, every day literally counts for Scottish tourism. So is there any way the First Minister could bring forward the publication of that review from the 2nd of July, even by a few days? First Minister. Um, I, I'm sure, uh, and I say this uh, very seriously, that if I was to put pressure on uh, an independent advisory uh, group uh, to give me advice earlier than they were ready to do so, Jackson Carlow would probably be the first one getting to his feet criticising me for that. The advisory group has been asked to give advice by the 2nd of July. They will do that when they feel that advice is ready and I will immediately report on that and any implications of it. I understand and actually sympathise and empathise with the position of businesses who, uh, for reasons we all understand, consider that the two metres physical distancing rules makes their economic viability very difficult and some have expressed that they think it would make it uh, impossible. It is not in anybody's interest to see businesses uh, unnecessarily deal with restrictions of that nature. But let me say also quite candidly and quite directly and quite bluntly 
Uh, if we have a, a second spike or wave or uh, outbreaks of this virus, uh, then hotels, restaurants, cafes, uh, whole swathes of the economy will be forced to close again and all of us will remain in lockdown longer than I believe is necessary. So it's important that we proceed carefully. It's important that we proceed uh, on the basis of the best possible advice and that I and the government apply our best judgment to that. That is how we have proceeded thus far. I believe that is why we now have uh, this virus uh, closer to the point of elimination in Scotland um, and indeed why we see infection rates and thankfully now the number of people dying at uh, lower than uh, in some other parts of the UK. So that says to me we stick to our careful evidence-based path and at every single stage put the health and well-being of people across this country first. Jackson Carla. Um, the practical outcome of today's statement is that from the 3rd of July with the abolition of the five mile rule Scots can travel on holiday to England but not in Scotland. Now the reason these industries are worried First Minister, is because they say that every day that passes now risks more jobs being lost. Take the case of one of the jewels in Scottish tourism, Creef Hydro. Now, I know the First Minister has spoken to the Chief Executive, so she will know that the hotel is on its knees with just 10% occupancy booked for next month, losing tens of thousands of pounds every day uh, in July. Uh, last, uh, last year, the hotel took three million pounds. Now, here's what the Chief Executive, Stephen Leckie, told us. What is gut-wrenching? is the thought of losing that and customers leaving Scotland and going to other countries. England and Ireland are ahead of us. We need to put the message out right now that Scotland is open for tourists. Does the First Minister not see that leaving all this to a possible reopening on July the 15th is too little too late? Does she not understand the need to act more quickly on the two-metre question? And will she at least consider acting more proactively so we can save Scottish jobs? First Minister. Uh, Jessica Carlo talks about livelihoods at risk and uh, believe me uh, that weighs very heavily on me each and every single day. Um, it is not something uh, I dismiss in any way, it is certainly not something I dismiss lightly. But the other thing that weighs on me very heavily and has done uh, throughout the uh, past three months is that every step we take uh, that potentially risks this virus running out of control again doesn't just put livelihoods at risk, it puts lives at risk. And I am not prepared to do that in some kind of reckless race with other parts of the UK. I am determined to get this right and to balance the various harms that we know are being done to our country and our economy right now in a way that builds uh, as quick a recovery as possible, but fundamentally, even more importantly, that builds a sustainable recovery. Uh, I want to act as quickly as I possibly can, but I want to make sure that is on the basis of evidence. Uh, I've tried, and I will continue to try, because I don't think it's fair or, or, or justified uh, not to criticise other leaders taking very, very difficult decisions. But the decision that was taken on the two-metre uh, rule yesterday, which is not a complete abandonment, incidentally, of the two-metre rule, but, but I personally have still not seen the evidence that underpins that. Uh, I have to make sure that these decisions are based on evidence. Now, that evidence may not answer all of the questions, uh, but it will allow me to apply judgment in a careful way. That's why I have asked the advisory group to give me that evidence uh, on a, a very short time scale. We will have that evidence next week, and then I will report uh, on that and the implications of that. And I think that is the best way forward. The worst thing I could do right now, uh, and I understand uh, the, the pressures that businesses are under, I understand the pressures that everybody across the country is under, but the worst thing I could do right now uh, was to take uh, decisions that I uh, thought were hasty decisions, not properly based on evidence, and that risked a second wave or, or further outbreaks of this virus, because that would send all of us back, it would put lives on the line, and it would not be uh, good for the long term for businesses or for our economy. Our careful approach has brought us to where we are now, and it's our careful approach that will get us out the other side of this safely. Jackson Carlin. But that is actually also the answer the First Minister gave to me last week when I asked for a plan to open schools uh, fully. And then within six days, the government completely changed its position. Livelihoods are at risk too. Together with clarity and a timetable to reopen Scotland, we also need better guidance. As the Chief Exe Operating Officer at Brewdog, Brewdog put it on BBC News Drive yesterday, there is a lack of certainty, there's a lack of a pathway, and there's a lack of communication. So it's not just dates the sector requires, if people too are to have confidence to travel in Scotland, and if hospitality businesses are to have the confidence to open safely, then we need crystal clear advice from government setting out how to go about that. We can't have a repeat of the situation last week 
when pubs made preparations to open up outdoors, only to be told it was all off. Whenever we do up, open up, can the First Minister commit to giving clear guidance and giving the sector the certainty and the time they need to prepare? I, I, I not only will do that now, I, I did it in my opening remarks, and that is actually why you have to be careful um, and give notice of changes so that the guidance based on the best evidence can be put in place. Now, we're taking uh, judgments. Uh, we are uh, recognising that we live in an uncertain uh, and changing situation. Uh, a global virus pandemic doesn't allow for certainties, unfortunately. I wish it did. But at every stage, we are putting the safety of the country uh, at the heart of everything we do. Jackson Carlaw mentions schools, and I think in some ways the debate on schools sums up if I may say so, the real uh, problem at the heart of the approach Jackson Carlaw is taking. Uh, when it looked like full-time education would not be safe for children, we developed a contingency. Uh, but now that our progress against the virus makes it possible, we are planning for full-time education. But we have a plan uh, for a contingency should we need that, because there are no certainties with the virus. Now, the thing is, it turns out that's exactly what Jackson Carlaw asked us to do. Five days after we published uh, the blended learning plan, the Conservatives published a paper in Scotland called Coronavirus and Scotland's Schools. That was published on the 26th of May. It didn't demand the return of uh, full-time education. Far from it. It called us on us, and I quote, to commit to flexibility on what happens in August. It asked us to report monthly from August the 11th, from August the 11th, on the continued need from blended learning. Um, and then it said uh, only, and I'm quoting again, if evidence emerges that it would be safe to move faster to a full re reopening, should we do so? So what the Tories are criticising us for now is, it turns out, exactly what they called on us to do. And I think that sums up Jackson Carlaw's approach. It's not leadership. It's not putting the safety of kids and country first. It is, quite frankly, presiding officer, grubby political opportunism yeah. Yeah. and no serious no serious person should be indulging in that at a time of national crisis Jackson Carlo well I mean it's a bit disappointing that the first minister relies on pre-scripted abuse from her advisors at first minister's questions I think it's pretty I think it's pretty, it's pretty clear what I asked the First Minister last week. Indeed, it's pretty clear what other leaders in the Parliament asked the First Minister last week. And it's pretty clear last week she said, I could do whatever made me happy, she wasn't changing her plan. That was what she said. Six days later, a complete U-turn. Uh, and I think that's there for everyone to see. Presiding officer, as the Fraser of Allender Institute warns today, this is already the deepest recession in living memory. A full-scale depression is possible. Now, the First Minister is right to say we need to avoid a second wave of this disease and that caution is vital. But as the Fraser of Allender Institute also points out, if we're to do that, an effective testing and tracking regime at scale is urgent. They say it is a concern that this is still not in place. Scotland's economic recovery and the return of schools depend upon it. So will the First Minister guarantee that the ability for us to test at scale will be delivered by the time Parliament resumes in August? First it, that uh, ability to test at scale uh, will not be delivered by the time Parliament returns in August. It is in place right now Absolutely. in Scotland. The latest test and protect uh, figures, uh, I think, have just been published. And yes, we need on an ongoing basis to build and to test uh, and to refine the resilience of that system. That is what uh, all countries are doing right now. And we will continue uh, to do that. Test and protect. Jason Carlaw is saying, uh, why, are not, why are more people not being tested under test and protect? Test and protect is there to test people who have symptoms of the virus. The prevalence of the virus is reducing right now, which is why we hope to continue to see fewer people being tested through test and protect. That's pretty basic stuff, presiding officer. Over and above that, we will be building up surveillance testing. That allows us to make sure that we are not missing any outbreaks of the virus. And that is the other stand of testing that will build up over the summer. Uh, and we're not basing this on untested technology that never transpires, regardless of the promise. We're building this from the bottom up, based on the expertise of public health teams around the country. So again, presiding officer, none of this is easy. 
None of this is straightforward uh, and none of this unfortunately contains any uh, certainties as we look to the path ahead. But we will continue to do the hard work, the careful planning that is incumbent on us as government to do to get the country as safely as possible through this crisis. And I welcome uh, robust scrutiny and I welcome uh, criticism. But I think people in Scotland uh, look to all of their leaders right now and expect that criticism to be constructive and also expect it to be rooted in an understanding of the complexities of the issues that we are dealing with. That's the spirit in which I will proceed because that's my responsibility as First Minister. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement. Uh, we all welcome the news that the number of COVID-19 deaths continues to fall, and that today we can look forward to an easing of the lockdown. But if we are going to turn the page, we should also look back on the chapter just written. First Minister, 0.7% of Scotland's population live in residential care homes. Yet today's figures confirm that over 50% of all deaths from COVID-19 have been from that tiny section of our community. And we don't need hindsight to tell us that at a time in their lives when they were at their most susceptible and in need of greatest help, these most vulnerable people were badly let down. Writing to me last week, Judith Robertson, the chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission stated, and I quote, the situation experienced in care homes raises a number of serious human rights concerns. She went on to reference the right to life, the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment, the right, the right to a private home and family life, and the right to non-discrimination. I agree with the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And when they wrote to the Scottish Government raising these concerns back in April, I agreed with them then too. Why didn't the First Minister? First Minister. Um, I do agree with the Scottish Human Rights Commission and I, uh, I actually agree with the, the sentiments and, uh, and to be fair, the tone of, of Richard Leonard's question. I. Uh, and we all feel this, I feel uh, more deeply than I can ever find the words to, ar to, to articulate this, uh, what ha has happened in care homes in Scotland over the past three months. Uh, and I don't say this as in any way to minimise this or to excuse that or to say that we don't have to look hard at that, but we see that in countries uh, all across the world. So I would simply say that we should not uh, consider this as something that has just happened uh, in Scotland, but it is our responsibility to consider what has happened in Scotland and make sure that we learn uh, lessons. And I have a, a very deep commitment to doing that. Uh, where I, I disagree, and I, I hope he will uh, take uh, the spirit and the intent behind what I am saying here, is the, the connotation in what Richard Leonard said that we have somehow uh, not acted as best we can to try to uh, protect people in care homes. Richard Leonard may, and he's perfectly entitled to do this, and I'm sure there'll be others across the country who, who thinks we didn't do the right things or we didn't do them at the right time. That is a perfectly legitimate view to hold. But at every stage, uh, from making sure that we issued guidance, uh, stressing the need for clinical risk assessments of people going into care homes, uh, through to uh, the guidance for care homes uh, around isolation um, and uh, moving away from communal living uh, through to the uh, strenuous efforts led by the health secretary to make sure that care home providers had top-up supplies of PPE for their staff through to some of the things we've done to make sure that care home uh, workers get uh, you know death and service benefit and get a top-up of their statutory sick pay if they have to be off because they've uh, got the virus and through to the work we're doing uh, around testing we have taken steps to uh, as best we can protect uh, older people in care homes but I'd say two things finally there will require, and I've said this before, a long, hard look uh, at everything about this virus and within that, the situation in care homes. Uh, and secondly, as I've also said before, I think looking ahead, there is a big debate for us in this parliament to, to, to be uh, had. And I look forward to Richard Leonard being part of this about the, the future structure and model of the care home uh, sector we have in Scotland. And I think that is one that we should all engage in constructively. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. The First Minister mentioned uh, government advice. And one of the issues raised back in April by the Commission was that despite what the First Minister 
has said in Parliament it was clinical advice issued by the Scottish Government that care home residents should not be treated in hospital if they were suspected of having COVID-19. This policy remained in force until the 15th of May. But it's not just Scotland's Human Rights Commission who have questions. There are many grieving families who desperately want answers too. This week, I was in contact with the family of Margaret Laidlaw. Margaret was living in an intermediate care home until late April, when her family were informed that she would be moved to Drummond Grange Care Home in Midlothian. Both homes that she was in had residents with COVID-19. And not long after moving, Margaret displayed the symptoms and caught the virus. She was kept in the home because her family were told that because of the government's policy, she would not be treated in hospital. Within weeks, Margaret sadly passed away. She was 65 years old. Her family are angry. They want to know why, why the care home was so unprepared and they want to know why, why hospital care was not available. Sadly, Margaret's story has been all too common. So what does the First Minister have to say to the family of Margaret and families like them? And do you regret that it took so long for the government's official advice to be replaced? First Minister. What I say to the family of Margaret Laidlaw is what I would say to the family of anybody who has lost a loved one to this virus, and, and in particular to anyone who has lost a loved one who was in a care home. I, uh, I can't find the words to uh, adequately sum up the sense of sorrow I feel and uh, the depth of my condolences uh, to them. It's not possible and it wouldn't be appropriate or helpful to the family for me to start to comment on individual cases in the chamber that I don't have the full details of. Uh, but I do agree um, that families have a right to answers. Uh, they have a right to know uh, what happened in the case of their loved ones and they have a right to question things that were done and, and not done and to, as far as is possible, get the answers. And I, as I have said on previous occasions, I have a, a very deep and strong commitment to doing what is required to, to facilitate that, that process. On the issue of uh, what Richard Leonard has described as government policy, it is not, and he will have heard uh, not just me and the health secretary, but the chief medical officer say this uh, as well. It is not a matter of policy uh, whether an individual in a care home or anywhere else is admitted to hospital or not. Clinical advice that is issued, which will be issued in, in many different circumstances for many uh, different scenarios, is then uh, applied and interpreted by clinicians uh, who then have the job, often in consultation with families, of deciding uh, where the best location of care is for an older person. Uh, what Richard Leonard will have heard the Chief Medical Officer say in the past is that in in some cases, perhaps in many cases, uh, for older people, uh, admission to hospital and in particular admission to invasive uh, intensive care is not in their best overall interest. But where the cl clinical view is that it is, that should happen. And it is simply wrong to say that any government policy stops that happening. It should be clinicians that decide uh, what the best uh, circumstances and the best location of care is for the people that they are caring for. Richard Leonard. Thank you. Well, I have the clinical guidance here and it says it is not advised that residents in long term care are admitted to hospital for ongoing management, but are managed within their current setting. That's what it says. And that's been one of the greatest scandals of this pandemic. Just yesterday, the heads of the Royal Colleges sent an open letter calling for a rapid review of our preparedness to tackle the virus, warning, and I quote them, local flare-ups are increasingly likely and a second wave a real risk. So questions about whether the Scottish Government is ready for this is a matter of concern for us all, but it, it is especially concerning in the setting of our residential care homes. We can't allow a second wave to result in a second scandal. On the 27th of May, ahead of the move to phase one of the easing of the lockdown, I called on the First Minister to conduct an urgent review of the government's approach to care homes so that we would be prepared for the future. But she gave no such commitment. So today, will she listen 
Will she listen to the heads of our royal colleges? Will the Scottish Government rapidly review the support and guidance for care homes so that they are ready for any second wave or any flare-ups? And will she do it so that the rights to health and safety of care home staff and the human rights of care home residents are protected? First Minister. Um, I'll start at the end of uh, Richard Lennon's questions and, and, and give him, uh, I hope, a helpful answer that, in principle, yes, we, we are reviewing on an ongoing basis all aspects of our handling uh, of this virus so that uh, you know, some of the more fundamental look back will take longer and we'll have to wait till we're out of this, but so that as we go, we are trying to learn uh, any appropriate lessons. So I'm very happy to consider how we open that process, particularly in care homes, uh, so that others have a, an opportunity to uh, feed into that and an opportunity in Parliament to, to scrutinise uh, that as well. And I will take that away and discuss with the Health Secretary how we uh, facilitate uh, exactly that. Uh, on the issues... Richard Leonard reads from clinical, advi uh, clinical uh, advice. Can I, can I make the point, and I, this is a serious point, clinical advice is prepared by clinicians who advise the government. It is not prepared by ministers. I am not qualified to give clinical advice. It's got the logo, of course, but the chief medical officer and the chief medical officer's office acts in these uh, matters uh, independently uh, based on clinical knowledge and expertise. And advice is given to, to cover the, the generality of a situation. And the point I've made, which many clinicians uh, will make, is that it is often not the case that it is in the best interest of an older person to go into hospital when they can be better cared for in their own home. But fundamentally, the decisions about care lie in the hands of individual clinicians. That's as it should be, that's as it has been, and that is as it always uh, will be. Um, finally, on the... The issues of second wave, um, Richard Leonard's right to uh, warn of the risks of a second wave. I don't think it's fair uh, to say to me that I'm not cognizant of that risk. I, I spend much of my time uh, advising people and, and warning people that the virus is not going away and that we do face a real risk uh, of... Uh, I actually don't like the phrase second wave because it presupposes that we're, that we're out of the first wave or that sometime, somehow it lies in the future. A risk of the resurgence of this virus is there and will be there all of the time and we must guard against it. Um, and therefore, everything we do right now, from the pace of coming out of lockdown to the care that we are taking over all of these decisions through to the, the building uh, and continued uh, building of tests and protect is all about avoiding that and as we go we want genuinely to learn lessons I said at the very outset of this that mistakes would be made I am absolutely uh, readily conceding that that will have been the case so on to, to end this answer where I started I'm very happy to look at how parliament contributes uh, to uh, a review of our experience to date on care homes so that we uh, can learn any lessons as appropriate. Thank you. Question three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement. Um, and my thoughts are with each and every person who has lost a loved one during this pandemic. First Minister, half of working Scots are concerned about losing their jobs. Thousands already have. And with the tourist season shrinking, pubs and many so shops still closed, new employment opportunities are scarce. Now, 50,000 young people are leaving education and entering the toughest of labour markets. So a job guarantee for young people has never been more, more necessary, and I welcome the widespread support that exists for this. Uh, this is a proposal that featured in my party's manifesto and one that our young people need. So can the First Minister tell me how quickly this job guarantee will be put in place, and has she considered the role it can play in shaping Scotland's fairer, greener future? First Minister. Uh, yes, we are considering that. So uh, for those uh, who might not know this, the jobs guarantee proposal was contained uh, as one of more than 20 recommendations in the report of the Economic Advisory Group chaired by Benny Higgins, which was published on Monday. Uh, one of the recommendations in that report was that the Scottish Government uh, should respond to it and all of its recommendations by the end of July, which we have undertaken uh, to do, and the consideration of how we take forward uh, that proposals for a jobs guarantee, which I said on Monday and will readily see again today, I am hugely 
hugely uh, enthusiastic and sympathetic uh, to uh, will be part of that consideration. And uh, that is one uh, aspect, but it, it will not be the only one of how, as we come out of this, uh, hopefully come out of this incredibly difficult period, we can use the process of recovery uh, to further and accelerate progress towards things that we uh, already uh, were aiming for and, and know how important they are. And, and, and part of that, of course, is our transition uh, to a net zero uh, economy and society. Um, and therefore, uh, using a job guarantee to ensure that the skills and the opportunities we're giving young people uh, through this very difficult period are the skills that we need for that and the skills that will stand them in best stead for the future uh, is an opportunity out of a crisis that we should absolutely grab with both hands. And the government looks forward to doing that, working with business. Alison Johnson. Thank you. I welcome the First Minister's positive response. We know that unemployment scars, and a week is a long time, um, particularly for young people who face such uncertainty. So we need to create jobs and apprenticeships now. And one area where the Scottish Government could do this is energy efficiency. By improving our housing stock, we could create thousands of jobs for builders, roofers, plumbers, heating engineers, joiners, window fitters, insulation specialists, plasterers, electricians, painters and decorators. Now, this is tried and tested energy efficiency investment in Germany and in South Korea were central planks of their recovery from the 2008 financial crisis. Now, earlier this year, the Greens secured tens of millions of pounds for these programmes. But will the First Minister now commit to going further and faster and investing in this urgently? First Minister. Uh, I agree with uh, Alison Johnson and uh, in summary, yes, I, I do commit to that. We have to, though, turn uh, that commitment into uh, detailed uh, plans, which is the process we will go through as we respond uh, to the advisory group's report and beyond. But there is no doubt we've invested heavily in energy efficiency, uh, but for the economic uh, and uh, opportunities of young people reasons she talks about, as well as our uh, environmental ambitions, it is absolutely an opportunity to pick up the pace and the scale of what we are doing. So on that front, I uh, certainly hope that there'll be a, a lot of common ground there as we go through the weeks and months to come. Um, on a more general point, and you know, I uh, absolutely uh, believe to my core that we have a, an obligation, all of us, not just the government, all of us, and business as well, to make sure that this generation does not uh, bear the brunt and uh, the long-term legacy of what we've lived through in the past three months and will undoubtedly continue to live through for some time to come. I, like others in this chamber, I grew up in uh, the 1980s, uh, 1970s and 80s through the, the worst of the Thatcher years when unemployment and youth unemployment was a, an ever-present scourge. I, I remember that vividly and I remember the impact that had on people in the community I grew up in and I don't want Scotland uh, to go back to that. So we all have an opportunity and I hope it's one we will work together on to make sure that whatever else comes out of the crisis, uh, we will ensure that our young people don't pay the long-term price of it. And that will be true in schools, colleges, universities and in terms of their employment opportunities now and in years to come and I certainly commit myself uh, to that aim right now. Question for Willie Rennie. Uh, I know we have our differences but I want to thank the First Minister for her work and personal efforts over the last three months. Daily press conferences and extensive behind the scenes work will have taken a toll on her. I want to thank ministers as well who have made a special effort to work with MSPs from all parties. It's the type of cooperation that people should expect at a time of a national crisis. So I think we should all thank them for that effort. I support the return to full-time schooling, but it's the last few days before the end of term. Teachers are exhausted. So can the First Minister tell them whether they will get a break and have enough time and resource to prepare for the new setup for full-time education? Teachers are anxious. Will they have access to testing? And what about teachers and children who are shielding? Will they be returning to full-time schooling in August? Uh, firstly, can I, I thank Willie Rennie for his opening comments. I uh, and ministers don't need thanks. We're simply doing our jobs. But his comments do give me the opportunity to place on record today my uh, heartfelt thanks to everybody working behind the scenes within the Scottish Government because they have put in uh, a shift and a half and that is an understatement and I will be forever grateful for, uh, to them for all the work they have uh, been doing. Um, on the uh, substance of uh, the question, uh, yes, of course, teachers will get a break. They have been working uh, very hard um, 
throughout all of this. Um, and I want to be very clear. Well, firstly, I want to thank teachers and councils for the work they have done to uh, make sure that we do have the contingency of blended learning because we may need it. And I, I want to be very clear about that. We, we have no certainties with this virus. And if we see a resurgence nationally or locally, that model may be needed. So that has not been wasted work. And I think it's really important that nobody suggests that it has been. Um, and my thanks go to them. Um, of course, they need a break, like uh, everybody uh, needs uh, a break. Uh, but over this period, and John Swinney has been having discussions with teachers just this morning, and that will continue through uh, the Education Recovery Group, making sure that the commitment that we have to return to full-time education in August, um, that all of the work that needs to be done to bring that about uh, is achieved, is the hard work of the next uh, period. Now, partly that is work for all of us because the prerequisite is that we keep the virus suppressed and we've all got a role to play on that. But the other safety measures that need to be put in place, uh, and that will include the particular arrangements around physical distancing, um, and also testing. So I absolutely believe that there is a big role for testing in assuring teachers and parents of the safety of schools. Uh, but the details of that are, is the work that we will now do that the Deputy First Minister will lead to make sure that before schools go back, uh, teachers, parents and young people themselves have confidence in the safety of the education that they will be having. Will they ready? Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer and we do need that detail as soon as possible because they do need as much certainty as possible so that they can get that break and they can be ready for August. But I want to move on to something I've asked repeatedly about in the last period. It's about childcare, especially over the summer, for thousands of parents returning to work. If parents had been asked by the government to return to work, the government has a duty to ensure there is enough childcare for them. The First Minister knows I'm cautious because I want people to be safe, but this new plan remains disjointed. Why are parents being asked to go back to work by the government when childminders and nurseries will stay closed for another three weeks on a full-time basis? Why are outdoor children's summer clubs and activities not allowed to open for another three weeks? Parents need the detail because they are returning to work from now. When are they going to get that detail? Well, firstly, in the spirit of agreement and consensus, can I say Willie Rennie is right to raise this issue. I said last week, and it's, it's something I, I don't relish saying because it is not the position anybody in my position wants to be in, but there are imperfections in how we uh, do things right now, given the nature of what we are dealing with. We are trying to align these plans as much as possible. Um, and while the, the slightly slower pace out of lockdown we're taking in Scotland is for public health reasons, uh, there is also uh, an objective there uh, about trying to align as far as possible, if not perfectly, uh, the return to work with the build-up of childcare again. So can I say to Willie Rennie, though, childminders uh, are open, although with still with restrictions on their operation. Outdoor nurseries are also able to be open. What I've announced today envisages the opening of all early learning and childcare um, from the 15th of July. Um, and clearly that will be, uh, to some extent, uh, dependent on individual provider arrangements and Initially, I would imagine capacity will be restricted, but that will build up again. What we also did last week, again, it wasn't the driving motivation, was uh, open up the extended household uh, model, uh, which does open the possibility for some informal childcare. I had uh, hoped we might be able to ex extend that uh, by today, but we uh, have to do a little bit more work just to understand the impacts of that. But I would hope this time next week we will extend that model a bit further. Now, does all of that add up to an absolutely perfect plan. I, I readily concede that it doesn't. I'm not sure perfection in any of this, given what we're dealing with right now, is possible, although we, we strive for it where we can. Uh, but we will continue to try to make sure that these different pieces uh, are aligned as far as possible. And we absolutely understand the importance for parents uh, of having appropriate childcare for their children as they increasingly go back to work. Thank you. Question number five, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what guidance the Scottish Government has provided to meet processing facilities to ensure the health and safety of the workforce in light of recent closures of such facilities across the UK due to large numbers of staff being diagnosed with COVID-19. 
First Minister. Uh, this is a, a really important issue uh, in light of uh, some developments in other parts of the world. Uh, food Standards Scotland has provided comprehensive guidance and a risk assessment tool to help the food industry ensure their staff are protected from the risk of COVID. The guidance supports them in implementing physical distancing, personal hygiene and cleaning and disinfection measures to prevent transmission in food production settings, including meat processing facilities while maintaining high standards of food safety. A significant number of measures have been introduced, such as increased cleaning and disinfection, screens on production lines and physical distance marshals. Uh, food Standards Scotland has also maintained a presence in all 27 Scottish slaughterhouses and has worked with meat cutting plants throughout the outbreak, agreeing physical distancing protocols and ways of working to protect the health and safety safety of staff. But as we see from outbreaks um, in uh, meat uh, production facilities and, and other parts of the uh, food uh, processing industry in other parts of the world, this is an area where we require to keep extremely vigilant. Emma Harper. I thank the First Minister for that response. Can I ask for assurances that the guidance coming from the Scottish Government to the meat processing sector and indeed other sectors will always be based on the most up-to-date scientific and medical advice and that it will draw on international examples to ensure that we have the highest possible levels of safety in our world-renowned food supply chain so that we continue to move forward out of the pandemic and not back. First Minister. Uh, yes, I can absolutely give an assurance uh, that it will be based on the best scientific and medical advice as, uh, as we are trying to ensure that all guidance is uh, at the moment. Uh, Food Standards Scotland's guidance uh, and risk assessment tool has uh, been cleared by Public Health Scotland and it takes account of the UK government's guidance as well as international guidelines from the World Health Organisation and other public bodies. Uh, Food Standards Scotland is also having regular dialogue with counterparts in countries like Canada, New Zealand, Australia and the USA and sharing experience and advice. And of course, we will also look very carefully at uh, examples of outbreaks from facilities like this, uh, such as the one uh, in recent times in Germany, to make sure that we can learn any appropriate lessons. Question six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will support community sport restarting as lockdown restrictions are lifted. First Minister. Uh, we continue to prioritise the return of grassroots sport for our communities and particularly for our young people. We're supporting uh, community sports clubs and organisations to prepare to reopen as uh, soon as it's safe to do so. Sports Scotland are working with Scottish governing bodies of, of sport to ensure there's a sports-specific guidance available to sports clubs and community organisations at each phase of uh, the route map. Uh, we're also helping sporting organisations and groups to access the various funding streams available. Uh, for example, to date, the Third Sector Resilience Fund has awarded 169 grants to sports organisations with a value of over 2.3 million. Uh, Throughout the pandemic, we've recognised the benefits of physical activity, ensuring that people could get outside to exercise every day. Uh, we've also been able to allow a number of outdoor sporting activities to return with strict guidance in place on physical distancing. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? I know she knows the importance of being active, especially within a social environment. It's important to our physical, mental and emotional health. And our sports clubs and organisations across the country are key to this. However, sports clubs are reporting a serious reduction in membership with a whole year of recruiting uh, missing here and alleyways are under extreme financial pressure. First Minister, I think we're in danger of losing vital community assets just when we need them most and a lack of physical activity will manifest itself in increased pressure on our NHS. So what assurances can the Scottish Government offer the thousands of sports clubs and volunteers across Scotland that their contribution will be valued and supported in the months and years ahead? First Minister. Uh, we'll do everything we can to ensure that that contribution is not just protected, but that we continue to encourage and enhance it in the, the time to come. I absolutely agree with Brian Whittle that the importance now and in the future of uh, physical activity for young people is, is of paramount importance. I confirmed uh, today, of course, that organised sport for young people can resume from the 13th of July, uh, but we will continue to work with councils and organisations uh, working in this area to make sure we provide whatever support uh, that we can. So it's an important issue to raise and one that we will uh, continue to pay close attention to. Uh, Presiding officer, can I take the opportunity? I've been told that uh, when I delivered the statement earlier on, I uh, said that uh, a household will be able to meet indoors with people from up to two other households subject to physical distancing and strict hygiene measures. That I said that would be from the 15th of July. That was my mistake. The route map actually says the 10th of July. So it's an opportunity for me to correct that. Thank you very much uh, for that rapid correction. Now, question number seven, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister 
what action has been taken to minimise the backlog of cases in the court system? First Minister. Well, I think we all recognise, and I certainly do, the devastating impact that delays and uncertainty can have for all those involved in both civil and criminal court cases. The Justice Secretary outlined in his statement to Parliament last week some of the measures being progressed and considered with stakeholders to address the backlog. Uh, I welcome all the work being done to resolve cases before a trial date is set, to make the best use of modern technology and to resume court business, including jury trials, with physical distancing in place. We're also working with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and others to explore options that safeguard both the interests of justice and the health of all involved. James Kelly. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The delay in court cases is particularly challenging for victims of crime, uh, those in remand uh, and witnesses. Uh, it's important to make progress, but to safeguard the important principle of fair justice. Can I ask the First Minister if the progress that's been announced today will allow the facility for more buildings to open up within the court system? And can I ask specifically if the government will give consideration to reducing the number of members on a jury from 15 in order to make headway with the backlog of cases. First Minister. Well, we will keep uh, with the uh, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service all of these uh, options under review. I absolutely agree with James Kelly that this backlog has to be uh, cleared as soon as possible for all the reasons he, he cites. It's not in the interest uh, of justice, uh, it's not in the interest of those accused of crime, and it's certainly not in the interest of victims for there uh, to be delays. Uh, back at the outset of the pandemic, when the first uh, piece of legislation was being put through, uh, Parliament obviously had uh, very legitimately um, a discussion about some of the initial proposals that the Scottish Government made. Uh, which we then uh, withdrew uh, around you know, having <coughs> trials, uh, solemn trials without uh, juries. And I, I think Parliament, to be fair, would write uh, about that. But Hamza Yousaf made clear at the time that that would also have an implication uh, later on. So we're having to manage all of this. Uh, the Lord Justice Clark, Lady Dorian, has been uh, chairing a judicial-led working group uh, looking at how we uh, do take forward high court jury trials and clear that backlog. So we need to continue with this work and uh, make sure that all of the different options as we go along, such as those uh, that have been cited by James Kelly, are kept under review. Thank you. We move to open supplementaries. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Jimmy Green. Uh, thank you, President Officer. First Minister, would you agree with me that those who prey on vulnerable people using financial scams related to the coronavirus pandemic are the lowest of the low? Can the First Minister tell me what can the Scottish Government do to protect vulnerable people from such shocking activities by some very bad people at this time? First Minister. Well, <clears throat> uh, Bruce Crawford is absolutely right. I, I think that anybody who perpetrates a scam on a vulnerable person is at any time, to use Bruce Crawford's uh, phrase, the, the lowest of the law. It is just behaviour that is disgraceful, disgusting, um, and uh, those who uh, indulge in it should be deeply and utterly ashamed of themselves. Uh, that's true all of the time, but to, to do that at a time like this when everybody, uh, individually and collectively, is dealing with an unprecedented crisis and going through the most difficult of circumstances is just uh, beyond my comprehension. So I absolutely uh, want to share in Bruce Crawford's uh, condemnation of anybody who would uh, behave in that manner. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, has already uh, worked uh, in train and, and has had work underway to try to educate people and, and uh, make people aware of the risks of scamming um, and we will continue to, to go forward with that. We will also, uh, particularly in light of Bruce Crawford's question, uh, look again at whether there is further action we can take in light of the particular circumstances that we're living through right now. Jamie Green to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I return to the important issue of uh, childcare? Um, the measures announced today to reopen more nursery settings is welcome but opening nurseries is not the same as ensuring their ongoing viability. I've had a number of calls today with evidence of local authorities not honouring their previous commitments to fund 1140 hours. In the absence of a statutory obligation to do so, many have already reversed existing promises. And the problem is, First Minister, that both parents and nurseries had already planned around 1140. If it's not delivered, they can't go to work. So can I ask the First Minister to indicate when this flagship policy will resurface and will she give assurances to councils that they will be not just told to deliver 1140 but resourced to enable them to do so. First Minister. Well councils were fully funded to deliver 
uh, deliver 11.40 hours. And uh, as part of our uh, understanding of the additional pressures that councils are operating under, uh, the money that they, because of the inevitable and unavoidable pause in that, the money that they were no longer, uh, for that period, having to devote to that, we allowed them to use for other purposes in addition to the additional money uh, that we've made available to councils. We uh, want to get this uh, programme back on track uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, I think it stands to reason, I think anybody applying common sense to this would realise that given uh, that part of this expansion um, involved uh, construction, for example, at a time when construction activity wasn't allowed, th there would be inevitable delays to this. Uh, but we want to get that back on track as quickly as possible. 1140 hours is something uh, we have committed to, it's something we have fully funded, and it's something we are determined to and will see delivered in full. Polly McNeill to be followed by Colin Beattie. There is a contrast emerging between those who have already returned to work but those who are still waiting patiently at home in the hope that they can return to work. And of those, many of those workers are not receiving the 20% because they're furloughed. Some employers are paying it and others aren't. And they're also concerned that if there is no date for them to return to work, that that would probably bring more redundancies at the end of it. Can I say, First Minister, that I really do appreciate the level of detail that you've given today. It's very welcome. But I wonder if you agreed that we need all sectors to have as much specific information about when they can return to work so planning can go into getting workers back safely. Um, I did have one thing to ask, and that was when we look at the economic turmoil that we all agree, unfortunately, is ahead. Will the First Minister ensure the Parliament that the widest level of engagement will take place to inform the recovery plan, all age groups, unions, workplaces, and ordinary people's experience. And I believe that if she does that, I'm pretty sure that she'll say yes to that, but I think that is the best way to go forward for a recovery plan. First Minister. Uh, let me make three very quick points to that. Uh, the first is, uh, yes, I will agree to that, because I do think it's important. There was a debate uh, in Parliament earlier this week, which I wasn't able to be here in person at, around uh, the report of the Economic Advisory Group. And I think that engagement, not just in Parliament, but uh, further afield involving stakeholders, trade unions uh, and the wider business community and the third sector, in fact, is essential and that's how we intend to proceed. Uh, the second point is I agree with the need uh, for as much certainty as possible and that's every step of the way, that's what I will try to deliver. But what I'm not going to do is give false certainty because I actually think that does more damage uh, than, than good. Uh, so when I'm able to say uh, that a particular sector can open on uh, X date, then yes, that will always have a degree of uncertainty given the nature of the virus, but I want to be as sure as possible uh, that it is deliverable based on the information we have now. But secondly, I want to be sure uh, that it is as safe as possible because that allows me to then uh, make sure I get fully behind whether it's the retail sector or the tourism sector and encourage people to get back uh, to using uh, these parts of our economy. So it's important that we get that in sync and get that happening in the right order. The third point I would make about the furlough scheme, uh, which has been very welcome, very helpful, has uh, avoided uh, a wave of redundancy so far, which uh, all of us should be grateful for, is that it is really, really important that that doesn't get prematurely withdrawn um, and that there is a willingness on the part of the UK government to continue it, continue it for as long as is necessary, whether that is in a, a, a general sense or targeted particularly at uh, sectors that we know will be hit for longer. That's a discussion we are seeking to have right now with the UK government, and I hope people across the chamber will call on them to follow the example of countries like France uh, and make clear that that kind of support will not be withdrawn uh, before the economy is ready for it. Colin Beattie to be followed by Liam Kerr. Can the First Minister advise whether consideration is being given to allowing coaches and personal trainers to work with more than two households a day where physical distancing can be maintained, given that so many people depend on these professions for their income? First Minister. Uh, yes, we continue to keep that guidance under review. We want to get um, as many people uh, back to work as quickly as possible. And, and I think while that's important, generally we recognise that for people in the self-employed category, um, that is uh, particularly important. And many coaches and personal trainers will, will fall uh, within that category. Uh, so we continue to work closely to review our guidance to make sure that we can do things safely. Um, also, for coaches who are self-employed, they can receive support through the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme or the newly self-employed Hardship Fund. Uh, that 
provides up to £2,000 for coaches who became self-employed after uh, the 6th of April 2019. And Sports Scotland have also provided advice for coaches, including information on funding, which can be found on the COVID-19 dedicated pages on their website. Gliding off, sir. On Monday, yet another established retailer on Aberdeen's Union Street, Malton Brown, announced its closure. It's another business lost to Aberdeen and more local people unemployed in very difficult times for the North East, due in no small part to this government's business rates regime. Has the First Minister any plans beyond the immediate virus response to review a rates regime which punishes the North East disproportionately? First Minister. Um, let's just not true, um, although I absolutely understand the, the burdens of rates on businesses uh, at the best of times and particularly right now, which is why we've invested heavily in rates relief schemes uh, throughout this crisis and we will continue to consider uh, support uh, that we're able to give uh, going forward uh, as we come out of this crisis and businesses uh, like the one uh, the member mentions can start to open and trade again. Um, so all of this is really important, but I, you know, again I come back to this point. This is this is an unprecedented crisis that all of us need to make sure we bring all of our resources and focus uh, to dealing not just with the immediacy of it, but with the aftermath as well. And I look forward to uh, having the, the support and, yes, the scrutiny and constructive criti criticism of those who genuinely uh, want to tackle these issues, as opposed to those who just want to make party political points about it. Neil Bibby to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Swissport have today announced 4,500 jobs are to go at UK airports. This is yet more bad news and means likely more job losses at Glasgow Airport. First Minister has turned down the suggestion of BNB, Unite and I for a task force to save airport jobs at places like Glasgow Airport. I've asked the First Minister three times now about aviation jobs. I welcome talks on the future of aerospace, but we also need urgent action now to save airport jobs of my constituents. As GMB have said, these jobs are the backbone of the Renfrewshire economy. Doing nothing, First Minister, is not an option. So what will be done to stop more airport workers being abandoned? What representatives are being made to the UK government about support package? And what is the plan for our airports? First Minister. Well, do nothing on any aspect of this crisis is not just not an option. It is not in any way, shape or form what this government has been doing. And I think even our sternest critics would recognise uh, that reality. Uh, we deal uh, and face, not just in Scotland, but UK wide, Europe wide, the world wide, we face a, a multitude, a plethora of very significant challenges uh, because of the virus and the measures that we've had to take to tackle the virus. Some of those create problems for businesses, others compound and exacerbate problems and challenges that businesses were already facing. Um, there are no easy answers to any of this and I will never ever criticise anybody in this chamber, across the chamber, standing up for jobs in their constituency. In fact, I welcome and praise that. But we all have to recognise uh, the real challenges we face and the, the difficulties we face and try to do that in as constructive and consensual a way as possible. I've given commitments to Neil Bibby uh, around uh, involvement in our work on the aerospace sector. I, I will do the same on other sectors. Um, I think, as I said last week, we've got to guard against just a plethora of, of task forces. We've got to make sure we're focusing on the actions that we need to take. And I hope he will join me as well, um, not in a party political way, but in a recognition of the reality. The Tories clearly seem to think all of this is funny, but I don't think it's, it's funny. I think this is really, really serious stuff. And what I was going to say to Neil Bibby is I also hope we'll be able to join together to make a case to the UK government to make sure that the right support is in place uh, for businesses and sectors as we go forward as well. And I hope we can all join together in that endeavour. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Dean Lockhart. <laughs> Thank you, presiding officer. First Minister, even when deemed completely safe to visit our islands, Residents and businesses will remain disadvantaged. Ferry sailings have decreased markedly and social distancing has diminished capacity by 80 to 90 per cent on some routes. By contrast, people who fly to the Northern Isles in and outer Hebrides do not have the same social distancing rules applied, which Professor Jason Leach agreed on Monday was an anomaly. How soon, therefore, without preempting the advisory group, are we to move to one metre social distancing on ferries uh, with a mask on while in enclosed decks? Well, I'm not going to preempt the advice of the advisory group for uh, Kenny Gibson, uh, tempting though he always is, any more than I was prepared to do for, for Jackson Carlow. It's right that we wait for that advice and then uh, interpret, apply and uh, 
implement where appropriate that advice. Uh, but what I would say to Kenny Gibson is I absolutely recognise the, the issue on ferries, the, the reduced capacity. It's not just ferries across our public transport network. That will be the case. Um, and therefore, of course, there are practical as well as economic advantages to having a situation where two metres can be relaxed. But it is really wrong to see this as simply a binary two metres or one metre. Um, and if there are going to be settings and circumstances in which there can be a relaxation of two metres, that, is, as Kenny Gibson alludes to, will come with the necessity for other mitigations. And therefore, it's important that we get that right. It is unlikely, pardon the pun, to be one size fits all. Public safety here cannot simply, and I know Kenny Gibson uh, is not trying to do this, but it cannot simply be cast aside. We don't do the country, businesses or any uh, aspect of our society any good at all if we take reckless decisions that allow this virus to start to spread again. Dean Lockhart to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the key findings of the advisory group led by Benny Higgins was that there needs to be much more communication and collaboration between the Scottish Government and key stakeholders in the economy. Does the First Minister agree with this? And if so, what specific steps will she take to address these concerns, especially in the context of the COVID crisis? First Minister. I, I, I agreed with it on Monday, so I'm happy to do so again. I, I think in any aspect of what we do right now, uh, no matter our differing views on whether what we did before this crisis was good, bad or indifferent, I think if we come out of this crisis and just pick up where we left off, then we'll all be making a mistake. We won't be uh, tackling challenges sufficiently and actually we'll be missing opportunities to do things differently and that applies to relationship between government and business as it will apply to all sorts of other things as well. We will respond uh, in detail as I said earlier on uh, before the end of next month uh, to the recommendations all 25 of them I think in the advisory group report and we will uh, put specific uh, recommendations down in relation to that but any relationship is two ways so we have to also listen to the other uh, part of that relationship about the changes uh, they want and the ways in which they think Think it should be enhanced and those discussions will be taken forward over the next few weeks. Neil Finlay to be followed by Julian Martin. First Minister, in November, after eight years without meeting messenger women in the middle of the general election campaign, you asked for a meeting. You said all sorts of sympathetic things and gave those women your personal commitment to do all you could to ensure US mess surgeon eh, Dr Veronicus came to Scotland to help them. He made his offer over a year ago in good faith. And all there's been since is delay, deliberate blocking and an action by vested interests who never wanted him here in the first place. He's walked away in disgust at this behaviour. For women like this one who have been horribly injured and disabled, the prospect of him coming to Scotland was their last hope of ridding their body of this poison. Listen to what she said this week in an email to me and you. For years I thought I had some kind of mental problem as I didn't know other people were similarly affected. I had to retire from the job I absolutely loved in a school. I had to give up the gym. I used to do Race for, uh, race for Life every year in the moonwalk. I danced my socks off at family gatherings. That person doesn't exist anymore. And I'm left a pain-ridden shell of the person I was. I hate me and suffer from depression. First Minister, for a decade, this government has failed these women. And I'm sorry to say you have too. Can I ask if your government intends doing anything to help hundreds of women live a life free of the brutality of mesh pain. First Minister. Um, can, I, can I thank Neil Finlay? And I know how uh, strongly, rightly so, he, he feels about this. And I, I would uh, pay tribute to the way he has uh, consistently brought these issues to this chamber. I, I take very seriously the commitments I made uh, to the women when I met them. Um, and we'll continue. We have already uh, taken uh, steps, including the, the creation of the fund uh, to help uh, women who have been affected uh, by MESH. On the issue of Dr Veronicus, and I would genuinely say to Neil Finlay um, and to others interested to try to work with us on this, I would say, first of all, we have not received any correspondence from Dr Veronicus to say that he has withdrawn his offer to come to Scotland. And, and that's a statement uh, of fact. Uh, Dr uh, the former Chief Medical Officer wrote to him on the 24th and 27th of February. Uh, the International Recruitment Team at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde wrote to him on the 3rd of March. Uh, we didn't get responses to those letters. The interim CMO wrote to him on the 24th of April, uh, reiterating that the invitation still stands. Uh, and we look forward to welcoming him when restrictions around COVID uh, had been uh, lifted. Uh, on 5th of June, there was a response uh, 
expressing frustration at lack of progress. Uh, there seems to be an issue here which uh, we thought we had made progress on when, when Catherine Calderwood spoke to him around the need to make sure that uh, a surgeon cannot simply come and uh, operate on women that he's had no prior contact with, that there needs to be pre and post operative care in place. And these seem to be the arrangements that we have uh, struggled to make progress with him on. The offer is still there and we have been trying to get those arrangements finalised and I will repeat again today uh, my personal willingness, although I am not a clinician, to speak to him directly as I did before to try to get the, the arrangements in place that allow that visit to happen. But I, I do think it is not the case and I think it is a an unfair and uh, an inaccurate characterisation to say that this has been blockages on the part of the Scottish Government or an unwillingness to have them here. Uh, certainly I can speak from uh, my own uh, personal opinion here that the contrary is absolutely the case. And I, I hope others with a genuine concern in this uh, will help with that rather than try to characterise this in an inaccurate way. Julian Martin to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, President Officer. The Fraser of Islander Economic Commentary published today states that if there were to be a second wave of infection of COVID-19, then the economy may not recover until 2024 at the earliest. The First Minister has outlined what our government is doing to ensure the virus is kept at the lowest possible le level. But does the First Minister agree that a slower, more cautious approach now is ultimately the most effective economic approach and that far more jobs and businesses are in danger if we risk a second wave by easing restrictions too fast? First Minister. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with Gillian Martin, as I think is evident from uh, everything I have said and the decisions I have taken so far in uh, this pandemic. Uh, we should pay close attention uh, to the warning in the Fraser of Allender Institute report today that if we have a second uh, wave spike, uh, whatever we want to call it, of this virus and we don't manage to keep that under control, then our economy might, might not recover until 2024. And what that does is demonstrate the economic impact of moving too quickly and uh, at too high a risk, as well as what we know would be the inevitable health impact and the impact in uh, the number of lives lost as well. Uh, I firmly believe, uh, and I think it is backed up by evidence, uh, that if we move uh, at an appropriate pace now, uh, then we build a firmer foundation for recovery and we minimise, because you can't eradicate it, we minimise the chances of having to go backwards into lockdown. If we go too quickly now, if we take uh, too high a risk, the danger is we end up in lockdown for longer. Um, so we have to get this right, and that fundamentally is in the interest of health and life, but it's also in the interest of livelihoods and the economy as well. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Richard Lyle. Uh, the First Minister gave an indicative date of 3rd July for opening of self-contained, self-catering accommodation without shared facilities. She also mentioned the risk of imported cases. Can she confirm that such a definition does not include short-term lets in communal stairways, given the risk to residents from visitors all over the world? And can she confirm whether advice is or will be, be sought on this question, and that guidance that currently does not ex cover this will cover in due course? Uh, yeah, I, I will certainly give an undertaking to both come back to Andy Whiteman and make sure the guidance is clear on what is and is not uh, covered in the 3rd of uh, July uh, indicative date that I gave today. Obviously, we anticipate, all being well, a more general opening of tourism and all uh, holiday accommodation on the 15th of July or from uh, the 15th of July. But I would stress the point that uh, we want to avoid at this stage uh, people sharing facilities uh, and sharing accommodation outside uh, their own household because that's where the risks of the transmission of the virus uh, are highest. But I'm certainly happy to come back to Andy Whiteman on the particular detail of his question. Richard Lyle followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, follow to your announcement, many shops will now be preparing to open next Monday and will be following government guidance to support consumer confidence. Will the government continue to issue, issue guidance for members of the public on how to shop safely? Yes, including the use of face covering, which many believe should be worn in shops. First um, I, I will do, because I think safe shopping and uh, those people who will be uh, using shops, the, the behaviour uh, that, that all of us uh, sort of display uh, 
when we're in shocks will matter hugely here. I know the British Retail Consortium has already put out, uh, I think, a five-point uh, uh, piece of advice uh, for shoppers, which I would endorse. Uh, I would add to it, though, and I hope they will add to it, the importance of face coverings as well. I said uh, we are still considering the issue of mandatory face coverings in, in shops. We're waiting the advice from the advisory group on high uh, risk transmission areas and the two-metre issue before taking a final decision on that, but uh, we uh, intend to undertake a campaign of awareness with the retail sector uh, in the meantime. But uh, making sure that shoppers uh, wear face coverings, that they uh, abide by physical distancing rules, that they follow the other advice that, are, that has been given both in terms of the spaces outside of shops and in shops is really important. And above all else, I'll repeat what I said last week, respect those who work in our shops, because if they're asking you to do things that you wouldn't normally have to do in a shop, they're doing it for your protection. They do not deserve and should not get abuse from anyone. Instead, they should have our thanks and our respect. And Alex Crowell Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Yesterday's announcement on the school's return will be welcome news to many parents, but for one group, it creates a whole new layer of anxiety. Lockdown has been the hardest for those children in shielding or living with someone who is shielding. Parents of these children will now be wondering what the new term means for them. Do they risk a return to crowded classrooms with all the risks that that entails, or do they hold those children back, accepting the impact that will have both on learning and social development? The same concern exists for teachers who are shielding as well. So can the First Minister outline what provision she intends to make for these groups? First Minister. Well, it's an important question. We will um, issue further advice to shielding people generally before the end of July, and I indicated that in my statement. We want to move to uh, a much uh, more tailored approach where we focus on risk and how uh, people in the shielded category mitigate that risk. Uh, but there are particular issues for children that have to be worked through very carefully. I know the Chief Medical Officer, in fact, I think, uh, I believe Chief Medical Officers in all parts of the UK are currently looking at advice on the particular issues around uh, paediatric uh, groups in the shielded categories and whether there is a change of advice uh, that will be appropriate for them. I don't want to preempt that because it's important it's considered uh, clinically. But whatever the situation is as we go into uh, the period leading up to the return of schools, uh, the, the, the situation uh, for those in the shielded category, pupils and teachers, will be properly considered and properly catered for. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. Just advise members to be careful of leaving the chamber, observe social distancing. We will resume at 2.45. Parliament is suspended. <laughs>